So, uh, we left off talking about kind of how we can get measures of variation uh, that exists in a variable, right? Or dispersion, right? So this is the idea that we, we talked about the range a little bit. We said, you know, this is okay starting measure, but it really can't capture a lot of things. We have two variables that have the same minimum and maximum, but there's a lot more variation in one of them than the other. So how do we capture that? Um, and the answer is going to be, I just realized you guys can't see the slides, so. There we go. The answer is going to be the variance, right? So I kind of showed you the notation for this last class. It's sigma squared, right? The Greek letter sigma, and then squared, that represents our population variance, okay? So I'll walk through this kind of nasty formula, and then I'll show you a, a small data set example of it. So what this formula is saying is, first of all, we've got this summation sign again, so kind of similar to the mean. So start with the first observation, go to the very last observation in your population data set. For each observation, take that value, observation's value for x, subtract, remember mu represented our population mean. So take the observation's value for x, subtract the mean, and then square that value. Do that for every single observation and then add them all up. And then finally, once you've done that, divide by the total number of observations in the data set, right? So one thing that we'll call this difference from the mean, sometimes I'll also reference it as a, the deviation from the mean. How much did that observation deviate from this center point of the variable? Right? So I'll walk us through kind of a small example to see how we would work through this by hand. Oh, put them over here. So I'll just kind of, as a reminder, write that equation up there. So start with the first, go to the last variable, for every single observation, take its deviation from the mean squared, add them all up, and then finally divide by the total number of observations. So let's say we have this variable x. And I'll use the same values as I did last class, I, I think. Um, if we find the mean here, recall, I believe it is six. So how would I find the variance? Well, probably the easiest way to go about this by hand is just do a column right next to the data where you're taking the deviation from the mean and squaring it, right? So for the first observation, we'll take its value of two, subtract the mean of six, so that would be negative four, and then squared would be 16. Then we'll go to the next observation. Four minus the mean of six is negative two. Negative two squared is four. Six minus the mean, well, that's just, Zero, zero squared is zero. We'll go to the next two observations. Eight minus six is two squared is four. 10 minus six, well, that's four squared would be 16, okay? So we went through every observation. We found its deviation from the mean and squared it. The next step is we need to add all those deviations squared up. So we'll add these values up, we get 20 plus 20, so 40, right? So that numerator there is 40. Our number of observations, whoops, we got five observations. So divide by five, right? The number of observations there, and we get a variance of eight, okay? So we went through every observation, squared the deviations, added them all up, then divided that by our number of observations. Okay. Any questions over a kind of step that I, I did there? Okay with that? So that's kind of the procedure behind how we'll do this by hand. Um, so a couple of things I want to point out here. Notice when I'm looking at that deviation from the mean, so the mean was six, values that are just as far below it as they are above it, right? Two is four away from six and 10 is four away from six. Both of them add the same amount to that numerator of my variance because both of them provide equal evidence of the same variation from that middle point of the data or from that mean, right? It doesn't matter which side they're on, right? And so one way that we can get at, so it doesn't matter what side we're on, when we square this, right? Negative four squared is 16 and four squared is 16. So it doesn't matter if we're you know, far above the mean or far below it, 
right? We just care about how far away that observation is from that mean, okay? So squaring it helps us, you know, treat both sides equally. Also squaring it does another thing. So let's say, you know, we had different, whoops, deviations from the mean. If we were just adding into that numerator, maybe we just took like the absolute value. So we dropped the negative sign. So it didn't matter which side we're on. Why would we, do we instead square it? Well, notice when I square these deviations, one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, right? So, you know, as I get further and further from that mean, when I square it, it really over penalizes values that are very far from the mean, right? Right. Notice here, if I'm three away from the mean, when I square it, that becomes nine. Well, as only being one away from the mean, I square it, it's still one, right? So as we get further from that mean, by squaring it, we're really over penalizing or we're, we're kind of overweighting observations that are very far from the mean, okay? So we add up all these deviations squared and divide by the total number of observations. So remember when we found the mean, we're adding up all the X values and dividing by N. So the mean is called the average because it's like the average value of that X variable. Another way to think about the variance is it's kind of like, right, we're dividing by N, it's kind of like the average deviation from this middle point of the data, right? Or the average dispersion from that mean, right? The average dispersion from that middle point of the data, okay? Um, this is another way to think about it, right? It's telling us how much variance or variation there is in the data, but more specifically, it's like across all these observations, what's the average variation from this middle point or the average or, uh, deviation from the mean, okay? Excuse me. Any questions on any of this before we keep moving? Um, so I'll mention something here a little bit out of order. What's the lowest I could ever see my variance be? Mm -hmm. Someone said zero, right? So the lowest variation is no variation, right? So zero variation which would translate to a variance of zero, right? So what would that have to look like? If I had a data set, right, where every observation was adding zero to that variance, right? It would be a data set where every value was exactly the same, right? That way, every single data point would have zero variation from the mean, and I'd end up with a, a vari variance of zero. I can never see a negative variance by byproduct of squaring these deviations, the very lowest I could ever see is zero. And if it was zero, it'd be a very uninteresting data set. Right? I don't even know why we'd be, be calculating the variance for a data set or a variable like that, okay? So let's keep that in mind moving forward. So when it came to the mean, our population, our sample mean, we calculated really the same way. The notation was a little bit different, but we calculated this, so we just added the numbers up, divide by the number of numbers we had, okay? Where the sample variance is gonna be a little bit different. So because we're, you know, to calculate the population variance, we had to use the population mean, right? When we calculate the sample variance, S squared, it's the exact same thing, but we're just taking the deviation from our sample mean, X bar, right? But because we're using a sample statistic to then calculate another sample statistic, we have to do something that's related to what we'll eventually end up calling degrees of freedom, so once we get to confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, we'll start dealing a little bit more with degrees of freedom, but we have to, instead of dividing by N, divide by N minus one. So this, because we're using a sample statistic to calculate another sample statistic is, is the reason why we're dividing by N minus one here. Notice when we calculated the mean, even if it was a sample mean, we weren't using any sample statistics, right? We're just adding up the, the, the observations divided by N. Here, we're using one sample statistic to calculate another, and so we'll, we'll instead have to divide by n minus one instead of n. Okay. We'll dive too much into the mathematics of that right now. I think once we get the hypothesis testing confidence intervals, we'll revisit this discussion. It'll make a little more sense. But for now, just know that we treat the population variance a little bit different than the sample variance. Right? So n minus one instead of n. Okay? It's the only difference. Other than that, every procedure that we were, did earlier, exactly the same. Okay? So when we calculate these variances, 
whatever the unit of the variable X was, that's going to be the unit of our variance. So if you know, we're looking at income variable, the variance is going to be in dollars. If we're looking at height, it'd be in inches. You know, weight, it would be in pounds or kilograms, however, however it would be measured, um, which provides us like a little bit of a problem. Um, so the variance is very useful, but it's not so useful in comparing across vari like variables. So for instance, I can't really compare the variance of income and height and say that there's more variation in height than there is in can't really do that because the units are completely different, right? Now, if I have two variables that are the same units, I can compare. For instance, if I had US income and Canadian income, and I said the variance on US income is higher than on Canadian income, well, there I, I can't say, okay, there's, there's more variation in US income than there is in Canadian income. But I can't look at the variance for US income and the variance for height and say that there's more variance in income than there is height. They're just, it's completely different units, right? So it's a little bit limited. We can't necessarily compare, you know, across different types of, of variables or across units, but within the same units or the same types of variables, we can compare like across groups. So it's pretty, pretty useful in, in, in context of that. Okay. Um, any questions before we keep going here? It's gonna be too bad yet. Well, we'll work through some more examples too. Um, so here's the steps just kind of written out for you. Uh, we've ar really already worked through a problem where we did this. But, uh, you know, just to kind of have nice, succinct kind of steps here, I've got them written out. Now, steps two and three, when I was doing this by hand, so subtract the mean and then step three, square the deviations. I would probably suggest really just doing those at the same time. Like you could break this down, right, and have another column where you only have the deviation from the mean and then another column where you square it. But really, it's probably just as easy to do it all at one time if we're working through this by hand. So ultimately, you know, steps two and three, you really can kind of combine those, right? And then we added up all those deviations squared and then divided by n. So technically like even step four, you could break up into two steps if you want, right? You add them all up and then you divide by n. But you, know, you get, probably get the general idea here, okay? And then this also reminds us that if it's a sample data set and we're calculating the variance, we divide by n minus one instead of n, okay? So divided by n minus one instead of n, <laughs> what's that gonna do to my sample variance? It's always gonna, Instead of dividing by n, if I divide by n minus one, it's always going to make that variance a little bit. So if I'm dividing by a slightly smaller number, right, n minus one, my variance, the whole fraction is always going to be a little bit larger. Yeah. So it kind of errs on the side of caution, right? Like we, you know, by dividing by n minus one, it's going to like look like there's a little more variation that that data is if we oppose or oppose compared to if we divide it by n. So the next thing we'll talk about, and it seems kind of dumb at this point, is another statistic called the standard deviation, right? So we have a population and a sample standard deviation. It's the exact same formulas we are using for the variance with one added step, which is I take the square root, okay? So I'll kind of throw this up down here. I can see some of you writing this down, but also I'll uh, kind of keep talking here. So you'll notice, that if I have the variance, if I take the square root of the variance, this cancels and I'm just left with sigma, right? So that's why sigma and S represent our standard deviations because we're really just taking the square root of sigma squared and S squared, which were our variances, right? So why the hell are we doing this, right? Like, I mean, why didn't I just divide this by 100 and then multiply it by 33, right? Like, it seems like an arbitrary scaling by just taking the square root. Well, what ends up being true is when we use the, the standard deviation, it's, it has a lot more effective interpretations once we get to topics like hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. It's a lot more useful. Uh, what's it? It's more... It's more applicable to think about things in terms of the standard deviation once we know a little bit more about the normal distribution, right? So I wanna introduce it here. We wanna get used to using it because once we get to some future topics, we'll be using it a lot, right? It has a lot more of an effective uh, interpretation to it, okay? So for now, just know that the standard deviation is just the variance, take it, but we take the square root, one additional step, okay? So, Let's look at a data set and kind of work through another one where we calculate the variance, okay? So I've got this old 
set of uh, football coaches, right? And uh, for Ball State. And so I've got the head football coach down to the video tech guy, right? And you can kind of see, you know, most of the salaries are between 150 and 75, but I've got like the outliers, right? The coach getting paid a lot and the video tech guy not getting a lot of money, right? So this could be any company, right? Just got employees, their position and salaries, right? So how would I find the variance in coaching salaries for this data set? Well, the first thing I need is if I'm going to calculate the variance, I need to know the deviations from the mean. So I got to figure out what the mean is, right? So how do I find the mean? Just add all these salaries up and divide by the number of observations. So here I think I've got 10 coaches. So I add these all up, divide by 10. Right? Just add all those salaries up and divide by 10. Okay. So 134,000 is approximately the mean here. So to relate to some stuff we talked about last class, if I think about the mean of 134,000, there's only two observations above it and eight below it. So if I'm looking for the median here, cross off the highest, cross off the lowest, I'm gonna be left with two observations because it's an even number data set. So if I have these last two, how do I find the median? I simply, yeah, find the average. So I add them up, divide by two, so what? 193 divided by two, so 96.5, so about 96. So my median's about 96. My mean was 134. So my mean is way to the right of my median. So I would say I have a right skewed variable here, right? And it kind of makes sense. So I have this huge value here that's pulling the mean up quite a bit, right? But not impacting the median near as much. So just relating to some old things, you know, uh, you know, we can always go back and, and make sure we're re reiterating these things. Oops, sorry. I showed it to you, so it doesn't matter now, I guess. But so if we want to find the population variance, what am I going to do? I'm going to go through every observation. I'll take 489 minus 134, right? That, that mean, square it. Then add to that 150 minus 134 squared. Add to that 124 minus 134 squared. Go through every single coach here, subtract the mean, score the value, and add them all up. Once I've done that, I then divide by the total number of observations, which I said, I think last class, you know, dividing by a number is the same as multiplying by one over that number. So instead of like having all of this with a big line and then a little 10 underneath it, you know, I'm dividing by 10. I just kind of wrote it out. I'm multiplying by one tenth. It's the same idea. Okay. I don't, I don't want that to be too confusing. You could, if you, if it's easier to think about, you know, you could just delete this and then put the whole thing over 10, right? If that's an easier way to think. Oh, come on. Let's see if we can get this to come back here. Maybe. There we go. I don't know why it does that sometimes. All right. So just so there's no confusion, right? You could just take this whole, whoop, this whole thing and divide it by 10, right? So we should get about 14,700, right? But, you know, if I'm looking at this, this is, I mean, this is a really long equation. Typing this all to my calculator at one time, like it's going to be easy to forget a parenthesis or accidentally not get a square, square in there. Um, so probably an, an easier way to do this by hand is if you have the data in front of you, just go through every observation. It might take a little bit more time, but it's less likely you make a mistake. Just go through 489 minus 134 squared, write that number down. 150 minus 134 squared, write that number down. Go through every observation, find that deviation squared, and then add them all up, right? Once I've added them all up, that's my numerator, right? The sum of those deviations from the mean squared. I then have to multiply by the number of observations, 10 that I have, and I get that, that same value of about 14,700, okay? Any questions on that before we keep moving? Get my phone out so I can see what time. You guys will get the early rant. I usually say, I usually, it doesn't, takes me longer to usually get upset about it, but I don't understand why the hell they put the clocks there because like, I should be the one that can see the clock, not you guys. And I can never see it from here. Like, I don't know why they didn't put it in the back, but 
I don't know. Anyways, I didn't design the classroom. So, um, yeah. So we've got our variants. We've worked through a couple examples. I'm going to skip a few slides for a second. Uh, we'll come back to these at the very end of class. Oops. There we go. So let's say we go back to that commute time data that we looked at last class, right? If I wanted to find the population variance here, which of these can I rule out right away? Yeah, zero. What would the data set have to look like if it was zero? All the same commute times, right? We don't have all the same commute times, so very easy to quickly rule A out, right? Now, from there, I just have to go through and actually calculate it, right? So I'll take the first commute time of 20, subtract 45. So that was our mean that we found from last class. So 20 minus the mean of 45 squared, 25 squared is like 625 maybe. Write that number down. 35 minus 45 squared should be 100. Write that number down. We just go through and do that for every single observation. All right. Notice that when we have values that are exactly equal to the mean, nothing gets added to the, because that's an observation that provides evidence that there's no variation. All right. Now it's only one out of seven. So, right, we're, we're really getting like the average variation across all these observations once we actually calculate the variance. But we'll add up all these deviations squared and then divide by the total number of observations if we're treating this as population data. Okay. Any questions there? It's kind of different data set doing the same thing. Uh, but I wanted to also use this to make another point, right? So let's say I have found this population variance, right? It's 414. Someone then comes to me and goes, no, 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 this wasn't a population data set. Like this, it wasn't a small company. This was a big company and I was just giving you a small subset of their employees, right? So this was only seven out of like a hundred employees. So, oh, okay, I should have been calculating this like it was a sample variance, right? Because my mean wasn't actually a population mean, it was a sample mean. All right, so I go back and I want to calculate this sample variance. Okay? If my, when I calculated this like it was a population, the variance was 414, if I instead treat this like I, I correctly, like it's sample data, my new variance should be what? I'm looking at these options, right? The only thing that'll change when I calculate this as a sample variance would be what? I'll divide by n minus one. So relative to the old variance I found, what should this new one be? Should be higher, right? Dividing by six instead of seven, right? So dividing by six instead of seven is gonna make that value a little bit higher. The only value here that's higher is what? 483, right? Now, you know, I go through this exact same process. So I'm gonna have the exact same numerator. So when we're calculating these variances, population or sample, we're gonna come up with the same value for the numerator, right? It's just that if we treated this appropriately as a sample variance, we would have been dividing by six. So we would have got a slightly higher variance, okay? Now in practice, we never should be calculating like both the population and sample variance with the same data. It's just, I was using this as a thought experiment to kind of get at, you know, really hammer home this idea of dividing by N minus one and then it inflates that sample variance just a little bit, okay? Any questions at this point? All right, so we'll come back to this slide, but I wanna show you something here first. So let's assume that we have two different variables. Okay? They're in the same units. So we can like, it's like maybe like US and Canadian income or something like that. So some variable X, but for two different groups. And for the first group, I'm going to draw out the distribution, right? So it looks like it's fairly like a normal, just kind of symmetric. And um, we're gonna say that it's got some mean here and that the second group has the exact same mean, right? And then the variance of this first group was 10, okay? If the second group has the exact same mean, but I then tell you the second group's variance is higher, right? 100 instead of 10, so much higher variance. What that's telling me is there's more variation in the data, that more of the observations vary from this middle point or vary from this mean. So remember what's on that Y axis here when we're looking at a distribution or a histogram, you know, is 
our frequencies, our relative frequencies, or our percent frequencies, right? It's some measure of how likely these different values for X are to see for this variable, okay? or how likely it would be for us to see these values for X. I guess is a, grammatically a little bit more, uh, more correct there. So with a higher variance, we know that values far from the mean, so values really far from the mean, if there's more variation in the data, the values further from the mean should be more likely for us to see, right? So we know that the frequency of these values that are really far from the mean are now more likely for us to see if this other variable has a higher variance. We also know that values really close to the mean are now going to become less likely, right? So notice what happens, and I probably drew this very, I exaggerated a lot, but what's going to happen with this higher variance is it kind of flattens my distribution, right? Because values further from the mean are becoming more likely and values really close to the mean are becoming less likely. So the variance kind of either makes our distribution more peaked or kind of flattens it out. So the higher the variance, the more flat the distribution, the lower the variance, right? The more peaked we get this distribution to be, okay? So it kind of changes where we're at on that Y axis. You think about it that way. Any questions on that? And you know, it doesn't matter if we think about this in terms of the variance or like the slide has, I you know, kind of ran these different um, distributions for different variables, all having the same mean. But notice here, instead of variances, we're looking at standard deviations. So going from the lowest standard deviation, which is this blue one, which is very peaked, right? To the very highest, which is this gray line, notice it's very kind of flat, right? The higher the variance or the higher the standard deviation, the flatter our distribution is. The lower the variance or the lower the standard deviation, the more peaked our distribution is. So one other thing we can think about, so we've got something that changes where our distribution is at on the y-axis. Let's say we had two groups and one group has a mean here and they have some variance. The other group has the exact same variance, but a higher mean. How would I draw that distribution here? So it's got a higher mean, yeah. Yep, right? If it's got a higher mean, but exactly the same variance, right? It's gonna kind of have the same height. It's just gonna be shifted to the right, right? So the mean shifts our distributions along the x-axis. Our variance tells us about how high the distribution is or where it's gonna be at kind of on the y-axis. Right? Um, and there's other measures that we won't do in this class like kurtosis and stuff. So even if they have the same variance, they could be like slightly tilted a little bit differently. Like, but, but we're not gonna get into that. All we need to be concerned with is our variance and our means, how that shifts the distribution or makes it flatter or more peaked, okay? Any questions on that before we keep moving? So I believe if I'm remembering correctly, oh, and sorry if you couldn't see that. I was just kind of had the means there plotted on the x-axis. Okay. So I think next I've got this slide where I've got all these different formulas uh, for Excel. So I posted a file in the in-class data folder called Indiana Weather. So I'm just going to use it to show you these different functions. And I'll post it once I get back to my office after class. So you'll you will have it there as a reference. So I'm gonna go over to this worksheet, which is temp normal. I'm gonna delete a bunch of data, right? So I'm gonna get rid of everything from April. I just select these columns. So I'm just selecting these columns and I'm gonna hit delete, right? Just so I, you, can, you can see things a little bit easier. So I'll zoom in so we can work along side the data here, okay? So thought it was kind of a relevant example since it's so damn cold today to look at some Indiana weather. Um, so we've got basically the average temperature in January since 1895, but I think it stops at 2019. So let's first think about 
can I find the mean, the median, and the mode of this data? Okay. I don't want to do this by hand. This is over 100 observations, right? I, you know, potentially, I, had a, I could have a data set with thousands of observations. I don't want to have to do this by hand. So for the mean, just like in how we speak, the name of the built-in formula, and anytime we use these built-in formulas, remember we have to put an equal sign, right? So equals, oops, average, just like we talk, right? We usually don't say, oh, the mean temperature. We say the average temperature, right? So the name of the mean function is average. That one's a little bit tricky, probably the trickiest one that I'll, I'll show you today. But once we have that average, we go over here, select the first observation, hold control shift or command shift on a Mac, hit the down arrow. Oh, I ran into a problem, right? Use this data set for a reason because I wanted to show you this, this shortcut and talk about this a little bit. So using that shortcut to go to the very last observation, well, here it's an issue because my underneath my data, I've got some numbers here. Why are they there? I don't know. I was using them for something else, right? Here was month one, month two, month three. Uh, you know, I probably should have left a space in between the data and that, but I did. So what can I do? I, I can select this with my mouse, or if I go back up here, I can show you another, another shortcut. So holding control and shift sends me to the very bottom of the data or to the very right. But if I only hold shift, it moves down one at a time, right? So what I can do is go to this very first observation, hold control and shift, hit the down arrow, then take my finger off of the control button. Now, when I use my arrows, I'm holding shift still, it only moves up one, one or two cells, right? So control shift is nice to like go to the very bottom. Sometimes we might have some stuff underneath the data, we can still hold shift and, and kind of use that to, to select the entire column of just the data. Or I can use my mouse, um, either way it works. And instead of scrolling around to go up and then close my parentheses, if I just wanna you know, go back to the cell and have it close the parentheses for me, I just hit enter, it'll do that for me, right? So it found the average here was 27, or the mean was 27.4. We could do the same thing for the median, the mode, but just to save us some time, and since we don't need these, I'm just gonna get rid of these numbers so I don't have to keep doing that every single time. Um, it'll make my life a little bit easier. So I scroll up here um, to find the median. These ones are easy. The name of the median function is median, right? So instead of arranging these, crossing off the lowest, the highest, next lowest, next highest, doing this by hand would not be fun. I can just select the data in this median formula. So control shift, command shift on a mat, hit the down arrow. I get the median really quickly. I could then do the mode. The mode function is just mode. So that one's pretty easy too. <coughs> Excuse me. I now have my three measures of central tendency. Any questions on that? You wanna see any of those cells again or you know, a little bit troubleshooting with something? Okay with that? Okay. So here, what type of skew would this data have? or this variable have, January temperature in Indiana. Yeah. yeah, so the mean is just to the left or just a little bit less than the median, right? It's actually kind of weird. Like these are so close that it's really close to a symmetric distribution. Remember when the mean is equal to the median, that's when we have this kind of nice normal symmetric distribution. So it's really weird. I'll, I'll geek way, out way more about the normal distribution once we start talking about it after exam one but like it pops up in, in nature and biology all the time. So things like rainfall, temperature here, like it, we actually have a pretty nice symmetric distribution over time. Um, anyways, no one probably cares about that. So what are the next couple of things you wanna look at? So the first one is population variance, right? <laughs> then we're gonna look at the population standard deviation. We can also think about if we had sample data calculating a sample variance, and then we could also find a sample standard deviation, right? So another nice shortcut, if I type things out and if I wanna auto fit the column, if I go up here, notice it becomes like this uh, line with two arrows going to the other direction. If I double left click, it'll auto fit to the contents of that column, okay? Excuse me. So that becomes kind of a nice little, little uh, short, or I don't know, Excel tip, I guess. Um, so we wanna find the population variance. The built-in formula for this, instead of going through and doing each one of these observations, deviation from the mean squared by hand, it'll do all the work for me behind the scenes. So if I use var.s, 
that not dot s sorry dot p right var dot p for the population variance i'll then select that column of data hit enter to go back up it'll do all the work behind the scenes for me so it calculates the mean finds the deviation of every observation from the mean squares them adds them up and divides them by the number of observations right so i mean this is uh i mean i can't imagine like i'm so used to doing stuff like this i can't imagine used to like doing huge data sets by hand, like without, without a, the computer, right? It seems absurd, right? But we can do it really quickly in Excel, right? So life becomes a lot easier. What about population standard deviation? Well, the built-in formula for this is STDEV, <clears throat> excuse me. And you'll notice the ones I'm showing you, those are the ones you should be using on Excel assignment. You know, if you Google it, you might find some old stuff. Notice like these like ones that have warnings. There's old, what I think they're called dead function or Maybe someone's better at Excel than me with terminology. They're like either called dead formulas or, or something like that, where they still work, but they're old versions. And there's a reason why they're old versions, right? They updated it to make it a little bit more obvious that who knows what STDEV defaults to. I don't know if it's sample or population. So they have these new formulas which specify what, what it is, right? So STDEV.P will find me my population standard deviation. So I'll select this, this column here. Hit enter. Right. Now, one thing I could do here, right, instead of using that built in stdev.p function, what could I have also done if I'd already had the population variance? Simply take the square root. So, how do I do that in Excel? Well, it's a function, so equal sign sqrt. sqrt says take the square root of whatever number I type in here, or take the square root of whatever's in the cell reference that I use, right? So hopefully if they program this you know, function correctly, I should get the exact same value. Sure enough, I do, okay? Any questions, wanna see any of these again before I keep moving here? I wanna to move too fast, huh? This one, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just SQRT, right? So it's, I mean, sometimes I wonder, I think these short, like these naming things are nice because they're shorter. Uh, and these ones aren't too bad, but sometimes they're like abbreviated to the point where you're like, I can't remember what the, what letters they chose to keep. But uh, so, you know, I can understand how it gets a little bit confusing. But once we start using more, I think it'll become a, a little bit more uh, kind of second nature here. Any other questions? Let me see a cell again. All right. So to do the same thing, like we obviously, we either have population or sample data, but I just wanna show you both formulas. So let's say instead we were gonna calculate the sample standard deviation of variance. It's the exact same formulas. It's just var dot s instead of var dot p, right? We'll select the entire column of data. And then for the standard deviation, stdev dot s instead of stdev dot p, right? So that dot, dot is the only different, right? Dot S or dot P for, for sample or population. Select the entire column, hit enter. We can prove to ourselves that this, you know, the standard deviation, the sample standard deviation function is programmed correctly by doing that SQRT, taking the square root of my sample variance. Hopefully I get the same thing as that built-in standard deviation function. Sure enough, I do, okay? So I'll post a version of this up on Canvas after class today. Um, I think these are, you know, this is the first part of that Excel assignment. I don't, I probably should reorder it because, you know, if you took a look at 1A, you're like, we haven't done this in Excel yet. But the rest of it, like the histogram and the time series stuff towards the end of the assignment, we've already, you know, covered all of that. Uh, but after today and with this file that I'll, I'll post up on Canvas, you should have everything you need to kind of tackle the entire assignment. I'd highly suggest working on it this week, getting some questions to me. If you have questions on it, you know, stop by office hours, send me an email and not kind of cram all uh all uh, Thursday and Friday next week. I'll, I'll be in, I, you know, if you save it till Friday and you start emailing me questions Friday afternoon, um, I'm, I'm way less likely to be able to respond as, as you know, or uh, as timely, right? If you kind of cram Friday night. As much as I love answering your guys' emails, Friday night is not not my my most preferred time, right? So so try to work on that early so you can kind of get me, get me any questions or problems you run into prior to, to that due date, okay? Any other questions on this Excel stuff? We got a little bit more that we'll, we'll kind of go through here at the end and then uh, 
I mentioned some things. Okay. So we got the Excel stuff out of the way. Um, I have these slides here and I'm going to go through them real quick because we're ultimately not going to really use them. Um, I think it's interesting enough to mention some things here. Um, and if we have time Friday, maybe I'll, I'll show you how we would do this in Excel. Um, because you know, before they had like these built-in formulas, they still had some computing power. And some equations like this were a little bit easier to use and weren't as taxing on the, on the devices. So instead of using this formula that we did by hand, they had another version of it, right? So these should give us the exact same values. Right? These are the exact same formula, just manipulated. So we can actually walk through the mathematical proof, oops, and show that this formula is the exact same as this formula. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on this. If you're interested in math, like it's kind of a cool, like little proof formula. Like I, you know, these things always amaze me and my mind doesn't work like this, but like at one point here, they just multiply by N over N, right? Multiply by one. So it doesn't change the formula, but having those ends and being able to rearrange them ends up giving them the sum of X's over N, which is just the mean. So then a bunch of things simplify and cancel out. And, you know, you can kind of get from this formula down, down to here, right? And, you know, you can see how maybe this would be a little bit easier because here I'm just adding up the X's squared and then subtracting the number of observations times the mean squared. So this could be a little bit easier if I'm doing this by hand or if my computing power is a little bit more limited. Um, this used to be a, a more uh, useful equation. But the way that I've shown you all throughout the rest of class to calculate the variance is definitely probably the more efficient um, way to do it by hand. Also, the way... Uh, to probably avoid as many errors, right? So that's why I kind of always start out with, with the preferred version of this formula. But there is another one out there that, that is really the, will give you the same answer, right? And you can walk through the data, right? Prove to yourself. So we have that old, you know, the football debt coach uh, salaries, square every single X value, right? And then add them all up. So we get the sum of the X's squared. We already had the mean, so we could square that. Now it's just a matter of plugging these values in. So we got the sum of the X's squared. N was 10, plug in the mean squared. We still have to then divide by the total number of observations, right? Divide by 10, we get the exact same, same thing as we did before, right? So there's a different way of doing the same thing. Not gonna expect you guys to, to do it. Um, just kind of worth mentioning here. Um, kind of completing out our discussion of the variance. So you've got, the Excel file, uh, Excel names also here in the slides in case you forget, but well, you'll also have that additional file that I'll post, okay? Any questions for me? Otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty, I think we're good for today. A couple of things I want to mention. Uh, there will be an online quiz that's due before we start class on Friday. So it's set to release, I think it's on Canvas, or it should be. Yeah, set to release in seven minutes, right? End of class. So get on a couple questions over what we talked about today. Get that done before we start class on Friday. Start working on those homeworks. Um, like I said, I'll be available during office hours uh, today as well as Thursday. Um, or, you know, send me an email if you think it's a question that could be answered via email. Okay? All right. I'll see you guys on Friday. Try to stay warm out there.